God is so good. I get the chance to um, uh, worship with family um, outside of the one in Detroit. Uh, I was worshiping with y'all this morning uh, during praise and worship, and there was a time in the song where it said confess, but there was like a pause between confess and the next word, and I could hear everybody say confess together. And I was like, come on, body of Christ, you better be unified, huh? Uh, So uh, God is good. We'll get right into the word of God. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. 37. I'm saying it over and over just for the the super saints that have their Bibles open instead of scrolling. Amen. Genesis chapter 37. We're going to start at verse 1 and because it's church, I'm going to read a lot of scripture. Amen. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had born to him, he had been born to him in his old age, and he made it an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to them, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they're grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of the cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing. And they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh. And they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. 
When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this and examine it to see whether it's your son's robe. He recognized it and said, it's my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been tor torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his sons many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Father, in the name of Jesus, do what only you can do in this space and in this time. God, meet us in your word. Illuminate it. Open our minds and our hearts to it, God, that it would take root, Lord. And then when you fill us all up to the rim and beyond, that we would pour out your love, pour out your wisdom, God, from our overflow. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I laugh because the Bible is funny. Um, they were like, <laughs> I mean, he is our brother. He is our flesh and blood. I mean, let's not kill him. Let's sell him into slavery. That's better. Um, so at the end of this chapter, this is where we find Joseph. He is in a pit, betrayed by his brothers. I had a long, hard conversation with God, y'all. And the only thing I thought about was whose fault it was that Joseph was in the pit. I didn't have any deep revelations. I didn't even find anything, anything less pity, petty than whose fault it is, God. Why did you allow all these people to have Joseph end up first in a pit and then into slavery? And I watched so many YouTube videos called like from the pit to the palace, right? And I was like, yeah, that sounds like an encouraging word. And the Holy Spirit was like, nah, not for you. I read commentaries about what the dreams meant. And the Holy Spirit was like, nah, not for you. So I was stuck, right? You want to be deep when you get up here, by the way. You want to get, you want to be real deep. And he's like, nope, I was stuck. And I was so awed by the sheer number of people whose fault it was that Joseph ended up in this pit and then in slavery. That just, I thought about the fact that everybody Joseph ran into was part of him ending up face planting into a hole and then brought out only to be enslaved, sold, in fact. Like someone benefited from him being thrown into a pit and then enslaved. That's wild to me. So I just spent some time going through the scripture and figuring out whose fault it was. First culprit, Jacob, or Israel, as God named him. In verse 2, straight out the gate, we learned this story is about Jacob's family line. This story was not about Jacob, but he made it about him. He decided to play favorites with his children. Joseph is declared the favorite, and thus a hierarchy is reinforced. The other brothers are recognized as the sons of the secondary wives. In some sources, Joseph is deemed the favorite because he came from Jacob's favorite wife. And he is asked by his father to essentially spy on his brothers. If you don't believe me, check verse 14. Go and see if all is well with your brothers. Why would you do that to a kid? He is one of the youngest brothers and is given favor over the older brothers, which causes them to hate Joseph. We'll get more into that later. It was the favoritism of Joseph's father that was the catalyst for the plots on Joseph's life. They recognized that if there was an Olympic podium, Joseph would be at the top while everybody else looked up at him while he grinned. All of this because Joseph, their father, 
has made this about his preferences, has made this about his choices, has made this about his wives. This story was supposed to be about Jacob's lineage, not Jacob. But in his selfishness, in his nearsightedness, that's the origin of this hatred. There's an article done by uh, the BBC called The Lifelong Effects of the Favorite Child. And in it, it states that that hierarchy of favorite kid uh, makes a poor sibling relationship, which we kind of get, right? The less favored sibling feels more inadequate about themselves and having a less positive relationship with their parent, right? Another study showed that favoritism of fathers causes stronger tensions in siblings than favoritism of mothers. He was just doing this all wrong. Like, none of it was good. He has fueled the hate of the brothers, all because of his connection to his being able to have children in his old age. Could Jacob have been fixated on his value in being able to produce? We are caught up all the time in a production trap. We think that if we can produce, if we can churn out a product, if we can get the job done, that makes us more valuable, that makes us more worthy or better. Some of us come from homes where we were ignored or celebrated by how we performed. You got the best grades, you got celebrated. If you scored the most points on the field, you got recognized and your name got called. We think God is like people. That if we put in more effort, he'll love us more. If we read more scripture, if we pray longer, if we give more, God will give us more. God will love us more. But we cannot earn his love. One time early on in ministry, it was after Sunday service. And I had some time in an empty sanctuary. And I went and sat at the piano. And I started to apologize to God. God, I'm so sorry I haven't talked to you today. But I'm studying And I'm teaching just like you told me to. And in that moment, God said something that would stick with me forever. He said, hi. It was a friendly welcoming. It was like an invitation to talk with him with ease, not as a boss who I'd let down because I hadn't completed my to-do list. It was God saying to me, I want to hear your voice. I want to hear what you thought about your day. I want to know what you want me to show you or how I can affirm you. I want to show you things. I want to make them clear to you so that you don't fall into pits. I want you to know me like a friend, not like a burden. I came to God with what I hadn't done, and he spoke to me about his friendship. That's Jacob's problem. He neglected to see how valuable he was outside of his ability to produce. The result is he neglected to value his children equally. Misunderstanding God's love for you creates misplaced personal value, begets misplaced and missed opportunities to honor others. Leading the brothers to a sibling rivalry that almost killed Joseph, Our parental choices affect the lives of our children through generations. And if we're not careful to do the work, the work needed to break generational curses, the work of evaluating our motives, the work of seeking help when we recognize something is dysfunctional, we will place our children in pits and into bondage that we couldn't even imagine. Second culprit is Joseph himself. Let's not alleviate Joseph of his responsibility. Joseph is a tattletale, okay? Anybody ever knew a tattletale back in school? I was a tattletale. Joseph, (laughs) Joseph was haughty and arrogant. All he did was send his father negative reports about his brothers. So who was around to think well? 
They all interpreted his dream as Joseph leading them. Joseph was meant to lead. However, Joseph was devoid of leadership abilities. Now, he's 17 years old, and he could have very well been able to work in the field. He could have been tending the sheep alongside his brothers, but instead he was spying on them. Further participating in a system that separated them, Joseph perpetuated an atmosphere of them versus us. He was inexperienced and needed help. He knew he needed help to ask for physical directions from the guy in the field, but it's not recorded that Joseph ever looked to God, the God who gave him the dream about leading in the first place, for leadership directions. Poor Joe. He just didn't get it. The dreams Joseph had were not only his they were from God for a people. When God gives us dreams, it's our job to steward them well. And Joseph, while having the vision of a leader, had little character to lead. And so, because of his faulty stewardship of his first leadership tasks, to care for those who he led, to encourage those who he led, to serve those who he led, and to speak life to those who he led, he ended up in a pit. Next, his brothers. How do you shove your brother into a pit? You skip every other step and go straight to, yeah, let's sell him. That's sibling rivalry for you. This is the result of Jacob's misdeeds as a father, the damage inflicted on children when they are compared to one another. To siblings, that can be long-lasting. When your first instance of comparing yourself to others is your sibling, that does something to you. The pressure in, why can't you be more like your sister? The pressure in, well, your brother can, whatever, why can't you? But God has made us in his image. Each of us given gifts, each of us part of a body that needs us equally. 1 Corinthians 12, 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. This is by design. So that moments like these, when you feel inadequate and come to the conclusion that you're not enough for the position at work, you aren't worthy of that new relationship. You can't do things like other people do. You can hold your head up high. And remember the God of heaven and earth chose to create you a masterpiece. And there is no comparison to masterpieces. They saw the good fortune of Joseph, saw his ornate robes, saw their father receive the bad reports about them. The way he trusted Joseph's word. And they were jealous. Jealousy is rooted in an erroneous belief of God's character, that God likes others more than you. So they get more, they get better. There we go again. Thinking that God is like people, that he has favorites. God is not a respecter of persons. Jesus died so that all would have the chance to know him and inherit the kingdom of God. I just believe that God loves me like he loves you. And that sin exists in this world to distort my view of God's goodness. God is the same good father yesterday, today, and forever. That I don't have to be jealous of what someone else has. My father has many mansions. And Jesus is preparing a way for me. And that one day, Jesus is coming back to get me. And the effects of sin will no longer cause me to doubt God's riches and his love for me. The brothers believed that what God allowed for Joseph was only for Joseph, and they would never receive the kind of goodness he received. So they were je jealous. It was the brothers' jealousy that got Joseph into the pit. Then we have Reuben. Oh, Reuben. Reuben, you're the oldest. Why didn't you just out and say, no, we're not going to kill our brother today? Why wasn't that an option? Could it have been the pressure of being the only voice of reason? Were the other brothers really that wicked? Was he afraid for his life? I have to say that it's easy to say what we would and wouldn't do when faced with choices that we don't have to make. 
Could it have been that he too felt the inferiority placed on him because he was not the favored son from the favored wife? What was Reuben wrestling with that caused him to lack the courage to stand up for what he knew was right? It could have been the same things we wrestle with when we're deciding to tell our testimony to a coworker. The same stress we feel when the opportunity to tell our aunts and uncles about uh, Jesus over dinner. The right moment, we're stressing over the right circumstance, but we just can't bring ourselves to share. This 12-year-old preacher once said, do not fear is mentioned in the Bible 365 times, once for every day of the year. God knew we'd be scared. That's why he told Jeremiah, do not fear their faces, for I am with you. I'm an English teacher, so I thought that was figurative language. But we do fear their faces. We fear the looks on people's faces when we talk about Jesus' power or how he consoled us, or how he changed our relationships, or how he finally inspired us to write the book, to finally forgive that person who caused us childhood trauma, and how he can do that for them. We are afraid of what the face of rejection looks like, that which causes us to forget the last victory he gave us. So we don't say what God has prepared for us to, to say. We don't, we don't do what God has prepared for us to do. Is that what Reuben is feeling? when his lack of courage caused Joseph to be in the pit? What about the Midianite traders? Some people might say they were just doing their job, Asia. But how does one get into the business of selling other people? At what point does someone reason that their will and their needs outweigh the will and needs of others? They were simply opportunists. People who exploit the circumstances of others with little regard for principles or damage to others. If we're honest with ourselves, there have been moments where we place little value in the consequences of our actions on others. We have chosen ourselves, our wants and needs above the needs of others. In moments where we took an opportunity from another person, we reveled in the chance to look well-informed and connected when we shared gossip about somebody's situation. But we never consider the damage we would inflict on their reputation. This Christian life we choose is a constant call to humility, to give our lives to others, a constant call to lay our lives down, a constant call to die daily, to crucify this flesh that says you need to look out for yourself because nobody else will. But instead to remind our souls to bless the Lord who provides for us, that promises that if we give, he will give it back to us, good measure, pressed down, shaking together and running over, to present our minds, our will, our speech, our bodies, living sacrifices, which is our reasonable service unto God. We do not need to steal, to deceive, even to gossip, as if God does not supply our needs according to his riches and glory. As if he does not make us well-watered gardens and ever-flowing springs in dry places. God reminds us that in all things we are more than conquerors, so much more, and we are warned. Ill-gotten gain will never be our portion. Because what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul, says Mark 8, 36. Did the Midianite traders even ask what can a man trade for his soul? It was the Midianite traders' opportunism that got Joseph in the pit. And as I talked to God about who was to blame and how this story was just messed up, <laughs> he gave me insight into exactly where the responsibility lay. It was God. It was God's sovereign hand that ultimately allowed Joseph to be in the pit. He allowed it because the pit had a purpose. Later, you'll find out exactly how perfect it was a circumstance for Joseph to be in this pit. How masterfully planned it was that Joseph was preserved in so many moments, including the moment where Joseph comes out of the pit only to be sold into slavery. Could Joseph's bondage be part 
of God's plan? Could Joseph's being sold into Egypt be part of God's plan? I don't know if that's where the plan started exactly, but I know that our God used it. He redeemed it for the purpose of the good. So it doesn't surprise me that sometimes things happen to me that I cannot control, unpleasant things, things I don't want to remember or write down or share, hard things. Sometimes, whether I like it or not, things happen for the good. Romans 8.28 says, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. But what if the hard things that we endure aren't always for our good, but for the good, the common good of those who love God? Could we accept that? Could we still think God is good when the good doesn't always feel good to us in the moment, if it never comes back to us in the way that benefits us in the way we want it to, can we stomach that a circumstance exists, a traumatic experience exists, that it was allowed by God, and we never see the vengeance God gets because we were never supposed to, because that wasn't for us, it was for the good the collective need of the human soul. Can God get the glory out of a bad situation in your life when you don't like the outcome, when the issue you're dealing with seems unfair? These are moments where I question his righteousness. Can I be honest amongst the children of God today? These are the moments where I wonder if I got this Christian thing right. That's the place where my doubts live. How many ways out of impossible can God make into the above all we can ask or think until we believe it's all for his glory? Which always seems so selfish to me, all for your glory. How self-centered. I have to suffer so that you can have attention? What kind of God is that? But if he says he is good and he shows he is good and that brings him glory and that brings people to him, it benefits us all that he gets the glory, that he gets the honor, that he gets our worship because we bow down and worship the God that gave us purpose, the God that gave us an escape from temptation, the God that rescued us from divorce, the God that met us after our families fell apart, the God that saved us from ourselves, the God that consoled us after we lost the baby, the God that gives us dignity in the face of bullies because he gave us that victory and our victory gives him glory. What kind of God would do that but our God? The story was never supposed to be about Jacob. It started that way. It was supposed to be about how God allowed every circumstance he used every person, even Joseph himself, not for Joseph to be in a pit, but for what happens after he gets out of the pit. Despite the circumstances, God would preserve Joseph for a greater purpose that not even Joseph understood in the pit. In pits, in times of struggle or confusion, we are reminded of the words of Paul who said, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things for you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And hidden in Christ, we get to endure to the end. That even if there are generational curses that we have to battle, or we battle our own arrogance and poor choices, we endure even if we suffer because those who were supposed to protect us turned a blind eye to our abuse. If we are a part of households that breed toxic competition and opportunists coming to mow us down, Without regard to our needs, we endure, we win. To see how God, in his sovereignty, preserves us.